I wanted to, to, to spend a little bit of time talking about the future and what it holds and a little bit about following up on, on Professor Sandel's comments on how we should think about it, what our attitude should be. And, and I'm going to start by saying that I think we're missing something, maybe because of the way our politics works, or maybe the way because the media works, we're not optimistic enough. I think that if you look, I'm going to try to make the case to you that the nature of innovation, the things that are going on both at Google and globally, are pretty positive for, the human, for humankind, and that we should be much more optimistic about what's going to happen going forward. Last week we just had Google, Google I.O. I think people have heard generally about it. We had more than 6,000 developers. It was sold out in 90 seconds. That's it was literally we need a larger venue. And the great news about technology is that you can live stream everything out. Uh, and just as Professor Sandel's course is now the number one global course uh, in, in, in the things that he talked about, so here's a gifted professor who now has a global reach. His impact is not just the United States, but in fact the world. The same thing is occurring with these kinds of information platforms. In our case, we're focused on Android and on Chrome, and I'll take you through some of the details there, and we can talk about talk about it in the Q&A as well. And you know, if you think about it, who, who thought there, would be, there was room for another browser? And yet, five years hence, Chrome is the number one browser in almost every market. Um, and if you care about security, and I'll tell you why you should care about security in a minute, you should use Chrome. If you care about speed, in other words, you don't care about security, but you care about your own time, you should use Chrome. And if you care about price, you should use Chrome because it's free. Okay, so I'll come up with other reasons to use Chrome, but those are three ones that I think make it a no-brainer. With Android, I think people now know that we've passed more than 900 million activations of, of Android, and we'll, we're going to cross a billion smartphones that are Android-based sometime this summer. In my entire career, Right. This is something that I would have never dreamed was possible, and if you told me it would happen, I would say it will never happen during my lifetime. It shows you either how terribly wrong I have been, which is always possible, but more importantly, the scale of demand for services and platforms that solve problems. At the level that we can do now, it's extraordinary. Uh, we also introduced Google Play uh, and on and on. Now, Chrome, I mentioned before, with more than 750 million active users of Chrome, Chrome is now a platform in its own right. And it's an opportunity using HTML5 and other, and other sort of extensions that technical people are building on to build applications that you could only dream of. It used to be that in the world that most of us grew up, grew up you had to have these specialized apps that were tied to the PC or tied to the Mac, tied to their architectures. And now you can basically, using cloud computing, have these applications come down to your general purpose browser, of which Chrome is the cheapest, fastest, and most secure, um, to do it. That standardization model is now going to drive the industry forward. So think of it as browser platform, Java front end, mobile device, with heavy set uh, data compute computation in the background. Google is one of the companies that's building this entire ecosystem, but we're not the only ones. And of course, we also introduced lots of things about Google, uh, Google Plus and so forth. In search, what's the end game for search? Getting you to the right answer. The most interesting thing about getting you to the right answer is that sometimes the right answer is not a question that you asked. Interesting. We have a product called Google Now, which is the first example of this, which if you enable it and you just let it run, it eventually more or less guesses what you do every day in terms of driving, and it tells you how long it takes you to get to work and to get home. Now, how does it do that? It makes some guesses. It doesn't have to be perfect. You didn't ask it. It's just trying to be helpful. I know that's a simple example, but it's the general point of how AI and computation will make our lives better. Eventually, you'll wake up in the morning, there'll be some flat screen. And you'll sit there and look at the flat screen, and you'll go, and you'll wake up, and you'll say hello, and it'll say, hello, Eric, because it's your bedroom. And you'll go, OK, do I have to get up? And it'll say, no. It's already scanned. It's all opt-in. You've already chosen this. It's looked at what's going to happen today. It's figured out roughly what it's going to happen. Is there going to be a traffic jam? You're always late to the airport, and there's always a traffic jam. But today, there's not going to be one, so you could sleep for an extra 15 minutes. How is that possible? Because of modern computation, the modern data that's available to all of us. You think people will use this? Of course they will. Think of the evolution of search. 
than from today where you type and you sort of scan and so forth, which obviously works very well at Google. It's our core business and drives much of the use of Google today. Um, think of that as eventually moving to a platform where we help you get through the day with this sort of infinitely intelligent personal digital assistant that actually sort of can help you figure out this is my priority, this is what I should do, this is where I would have the most fun, and this is what I should avoid. We, we announced Google Maps. Um, we changed the way Maps work. So now you get a personalized map. And this personalized map, again, with the information that we have, is much more targeted at where you're going and what you care about. We introduced something called Google Glass, which has got a lot, of, a lot of publicity because of some of the implications of it. And you sit there and you go, would I really use this? You betcha, right? People at Google who are trying this thing out, said this, they find it so incredibly convenient because it's always there, it's always helping you out. You can talk to it, it talks back. So what I'm thinking about, when I think about Google in the last year since I was here, is I look at that set of accomplishments and I see it as an opportunity to create a platform play for a series of additional platforms, right? That we're building on top of this computational knowledge that I'm describing, that we're building on top of the things that we're learning about how people like and use information, and that you'll see that, and you'll see that over and over again. Now, why does this matter? It matters a lot, because information is what people really care about. And in the course of writing the book, which I think you all have, uh, and, I, and would love you to read, of course, we spent an awful lot of times, we started off with sort of a techno-optimist view, if you will. We, we, we started off by saying, oh, you know, technology will take over everything, it's all good, you know, and so forth. But in, in wandering around the world, we began to understand both its more subtle goods and its more subtle bads. So a summary of the book is the book is really about what we think will happen in the future, not from a technological perspective, although we have it in there, but rather is how society will, will react. And in the course of all of this, we had to go visit some interesting places. Imagine a world where all the information that you have is rote learning, where there's no ambiguity, there's no textbooks, there's no alternative sources of information. You're told exactly one thing, and that's exactly what you're told. And that's what you believe, and if you don't believe it, you're taken to the gulag, your entire, your parents and your children, and a fair number of people are executed. That's North Korea. Today, this year, that's North Korea. It's not some movie, it's not some special from the BBC about something historic about human society. That is today. So you tend to think of this as, how can that be? 22 million people trapped in that, but it's true. How do you fix it? Turn on the internet. Put a little bit of information in this thing. These are people, these are humans just like us, trapped in the inverse system. It's Kafkaesque. Right? They can't get out, we can't get in. Trust me, you can't get in, they can't get out. How do you solve it? Put the information in. How do you do it? With mobile devices. Why? Because they already have them. That's the key insight. In North Korea's case, they have more than a million phones. They're all SMS capable. They are technically capable of HSDPA, which is, of course, the data service for 3G. Government chose not to turn it on. Who makes the decision? The respected leader. The respected leader has not gotten around to deciding to turn on the internet or not. Only one person can make this decision in that society. He's too busy launching missiles and doing other things. But that decision might be the most consequential decision of the entire historical context, because it's the one thing that can really empower the people. It's the only way at this point. But you tend to think, and if you follow that, I'm using that as the most extreme example. If you tend to think that, that, everyone, that everyone we know is online, everyone, everyone here has a mobile phone, everyone you know has a mobile phone, all your family members have a mobile phone, and so forth, it's only two billion. There's seven billion people around. So when wandering around, I discovered there's a lot of the world that I don't normally talk to. Uh, we went to, doing this with Jared, we went to Tunisia. And um, what happened was interesting is that the revolutionaries who, who ousted Ben Ali, we met a whole bunch of the bloggers and so forth, they've all become Android developers. It's great. But they need revenue, right? <laughs> there's, no, there's no new revenue. There's no long-term revenue being a revolutionary. Much more revenue in an Android developer. <laughs> These are smart people, right? More seriously, in Libya, we learned about um, schoolgirls using Google Maps. They would plot where the NATO bombings were 
so they could walk to school without getting killed. So you think Google Maps matter? They matter a lot in Libya. Um, I, uh, went, we went to Myanmar, Burma, um, where a, a truly historic revolution is occurring and, and Aung San Suu Kyi will ultimately, I think, be seen as the Mandela of Asia, and she's an extraordinary lady. Um, it turns out that the government in 2004 banned, because they didn't want the kind of empowerment that I'm talking about, they banned all forms of email. And in their law, they banned Yahoo Mail and Hotmail. Everyone uses Gmail because it's legal, because they forgot. So you have a country of 100% coverage of Gmail, where everyone actually uses Gmail to talk to each other, but the internet doesn't work at all. So depending on how they handle the internet, and it's not at all obvious how they're going to decide, we could have a huge explosion of creativity from this enormously beautiful culture and these great people, or not. The, we went to Mexico, where the government is tracking, uh, it has this hor hor horrendous problem with the, um, uh, with the drug cartels. And they've built an infrastructure to track drug activity and, co and uh, cover illicit networks. The most interesting problem in Mexico is that the police are so corrupt that when we travel with the police, they had to wear masks because they, they themselves did not want to be photographed by anybody else because they'd be seen as being legitimate police people. So what happened in, in the, the city that we were in, which is the murder capital of the world as of last year, the um, citizens have formed their own network to watch what's going on. They took over the monitoring f functions that the police would normally do because they don't trust the police, but they trust each other. And they did it using the internet. The, we went out to, in Kenya, we went out to the Maasai nomads. If you haven't been out to the Maasai, it's well worth seeing. So we're greeted by the village elder whose proudest possessions are, in order, his mobile phone, his spear, and his four wives, right? And he's very happy to show all, all of them off for the camera. You think it matters? It matters a lot. It's how their businesses were. These are people who do not have toilets, proper food, proper medical care, and so forth. I can go on and on. Maybe the one that, that affected me the most was in Pakistan. There are these horrific, horrific crimes that are done to women, where men throw acid on their face. Half of them die. The other half, of course, are terribly disfigured. And aside from the horrendous physical pain and recovery that's involved, they're not allowed out of the house, because in their culture, it's a shame crime. So they're now trapped in a house for the rest of their lives. So the story we heard when we met with these women were that they were using the internet to build lives, and that on the internet, no one knew that they didn't have a face. And in fact, one of them had managed to actually become a digital, a digital person, digital identity, had met a man and married him in, real, in the real world. That gives you a sense of how powerful the internet is to change these societies. So what will happen with all of this is that when these five billion people connect, right, when they actually get to us, the changes will be profound. So we think of what I'm talking about. Remember, I gave you all the thing about how Google was doing really well, which I'm very, very proud of. And we're, you know, we have this new product, we're excited about this product, you know, everybody at Google is excited about this. When you're sitting in a village in Inle Lake in Myanmar, where you have no entertainment, no medical information, no textbooks, no educational system, and basically no hope, no political knowledge, no, ex no way to express yourself, and the mobile phone arrives, it is a day you will remember for the rest of your lives. Even if it's a shared one, and even if it's, even if it's a slow one with a slow browser because it became, all of a sudden, a, a, a way in which you could get information. We were in South Sudan, which is a country I do not recommend you visit. Um, there's a war between South Sudan and, and the regular Sudan, right at the border. It's so bad, and people are so hungry for information, that the only way to get information into that part of the, uh, about the world is through micro SD cards, which are smuggled in small bags. And they are spread throughout all the people to figure out what's going on, who's winning, how they can win, how they can be empowered, how they can fight the horrific violence, local violence being done by one tribe against the other. But my point here is that, that in, in, in the course of this, the values that I'm talking about, free expression, freedom of assembly, critical thinking, and meritocracy, everyone wants them. Everyone associates with, them, with the internet. And, and I would argue that it is our shared responsibility to make that happen that in terms of impact and things that we can do as a, as a human society to make our world safer, less violence, better treatment of women, 
less violence to ourselves, less likelihood of state-to-state -state conflict, less tribal conflict, and so forth. This is the single thing that we as individuals can do. It's the thing that we can do that has the biggest impact on a personal basis. It's also the thing that is the most satisfying because these are solutions that scale. So, so to me, I can give you example and example after example of what's going on. Um, a number of examples here, you know, we have, uh, think about small business. Uh, here in the UK, the Cambridge Satchel Company um, figured out a way, as a, a lady who's very clever, she figured out how, a way to make these things out of the proper leather. She did it on her, uh, in her kitchen, and all of a sudden, she figures out a way using Google AdWords to get not just a UK business, but a global business building what turned out to be incredibly clever, very, very desirable satchels, which are now part of the, you know, the sort of Coachella, Fashion Week, you know, the, whole, the whole buzz. Now, did that have an impact? You betcha, because it started in, in her kitchen. It provides lots of employment in the town that she grows up in, but more importantly, it's a brand, it's an impact, it's something people care about. Another example, um, in, uh, in Germany, uh, there are these, uh, 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 basically the stolen uh, sort of pastries, bakery shops, and people are all of a sudden marketing these things. And who are their customers? Not just in Germany, they're all throughout Europe. You can now ship them everywhere. So you sit there and you go, does that matter? Absolutely, a source of economic growth, a source of branding, a source of culture, and so forth. I'm using those two as examples because they're easy ones for all of us to understand. The same is is, is occurs all over. Um, I don't know, another one that I thought was interesting was that there's a, a Swedish company called J-Dome that has a, a, an indoor bicycle and they're just having fun, right? You know, typical engineers having fun. So they have an indoor bicycle and they have a dome and you're biking along and using Street View, you're biking along on whatever street you want in the entire world. Now this sounds like the neatest thing you could possibly imagine. Because remember, Street View covers something like 3,000 cities, including parts of Arctic, the Arctic, uh, Arctic and Antarctic. So imagine yourself sitting there bicycling, bicycling you know, to the North Pole, which I understand is a little difficult since it's all ice or mostly ice some of the time declining at a percentage. Um, and the South Pole, which of course is on the top of a, uh, top of a land mass. So, so you sit there and you go, what a neat product. Well, there's a much more interesting solution, which, solution, which it turns out that, that if you're mentally challenged, if you have had various mental diseases, one of the treatments is to get outdoors. But the people are sort of unsafe to allow them to sort of go biking. So you put them on this thing, and the treatment turns out to have one of the highest uh, rates of improvement of any. Put the people on the bike, tell them to go bike around, right? Perfectly safely, I might add, right? And have a good time. So you sit there and you go, does that matter? It matters to the families of the people who've had Alzheimer's and dementia and so forth, who care very deeply about these people and they want them to have a good life. So when I think about this, put it into context, what is it? It's connection, it's meaning, it's the simple act of getting online, making all of our lives better. But let me give you a simple rule. There are no countries where the arrival of the internet has made things worse. And in every case, the arrival of the internet has made it better. Um, I think we are vastly underestimating the potential of these countries. Remember, they can leapfrog all the infrastructure, all the history, and all the things that we had to go through, right to the modern computer architecture, right to the modern way of consuming information. And I would argue that mobile phones, in the architecture that I'm describing, um, is really the only good news in many of these countries after centuries of hardship, of bad governments, corruption, which is the number one people talk, thing, issue people talk about. So I think of mobile devices as solving the education problem. They solve the, for obvious reasons. Uh, you can empower, you can basically preload laptops and so forth. Um, violence, especially against women, checked by the cameras and so forth. You can publish it, you can use it to shame the governments and so forth. And corruption, right? The most persistent of problems in many of these countries of all, checked again by mobile phones. So you think that mobile phones matter. You guys think that it matters that you have all this information. It matters a lot more than you think for an awful lot of our fellow citizens. And I spent my time committed to making this happen. I know that the company feels very strongly about this. But to me, I think that I have a request, and the request of each of you. All of us have done well because of the internet. Every one of you is here because of the 
the sophisticated global business approaches that you have taken. You understand smart people, globalization, interconnection, business. You're the winners, right? So my request of you is to scale our social impact for this next five billion. I want you to rededicate yourselves to making their lives better. In terms of philanthropy, in terms of impact, this may be the biggest impact that you as an individual can have during your entire lives in terms of scale and impact on humanity. If we, if we do this, I'm quite convinced the world is going to be safer and much more prosperous than at any other time. You know, Google does a lot, right? And I'm very, very proud to be here representing the company. I know the other Googlers here feel the same way. It's been an enormous ride. But we're not done. We're just at the beginning of what the architecture that I've just described can do to make the world a better place. This is what we do. This is who we are. Let's figure out a way to solve this problem. This is why we exist. Right? So thank you very, very much. Um, I think that uh, we had time for some questions or comments. I'm happy to talk about what I talked about or anything else. Uh, and again, I want to say thank you all. Uh, I've had the privilege of being at this conference for every year since it's been founded, and I want to thank Lorraine and the usual suspects for, uh, for making this so successful. I'm not sure what the numbers mean. This is like an IQ test. Number three, OK. That would mean number one. Uh, OK, good. Does somebody over here want to go, get started? We'll start with number six. Or, or are you a different number? I, I'm a person, and not a number. I'm, Excellent. Uh, <laughs> you know, the pri in the famous British Prisoner series, yeah. it was good to be number six. Okay. And then, it was then, not good to be number two. Okay. Then, <laughs> then I'm uh, Louis Hahnemann and number six. And my question is, I'm I'm nearly finished with your book. I like it a lot. And uh, you were saying there are the the five billion people, and they have to connect, and we have to connect with them. But if I see uh, the products of Google or of Facebook, it, it is mainly about connecting with the people I know or that are like myself. So that, that's a question that I'm really interested in. How is it go going to help us with the people that we are normally not connecting? And that was what the professor was saying before. This is what makes a good democracy. So that's my question. I, I, I can't give you a perfect answer. I can say that with digital technology, you could have more friends. Right, if, you, if you believe that the Dunbar number is correct, 150 friends is the maximum number of friends you can have, um, look it up. Uh, the, it looks like these technologies allow you to, to interact at different levels with much greater numbers of circles. That you, if you, that's a, at, some, at some level, that's what Twitter is fundamentally about. It's sort of broadcasting. Who, it's about your identity. Who am I? How do I interact with? What are my relationships? Uh, and I think those are being replicated in Facebook and Google Plus and so forth. Um, to really understand, to really get the sort of, uh, uh, how, the way I would describe it is, there are people in this room who should be your very close friends and you don't know. Because you haven't had the time, we haven't been here in a meeting long enough for you to hang out with them and so forth. Modern associative matching could actually suggest that. And there's a new set of applications being built for your mobile phones which will ultimately allow you to introduce you to people who have like interest and so forth. So it's probably the case that most human experience will be people who I like, people like me, people who I find interesting. That, that sort of random search, there's just sim simply too many connected people, how will you know the seven billion? But what we can do is have a jump ball where all of the really interesting choices are available to you using dig digital technology. So we can optimize the level of scale of friends you want. And the other thing I would tell you is that some people are introverts and some people are extroverts. Some people are extroverts, they have 5,000 friends. Some people are introverts, they have you know, 10 very close friends. Both models are, are made stronger by this technology. I see over here, number three. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> uh, I, I'm Robin. I've got a question about the bad governance that you yeah. described. And you're doing a great job personally with the company and with the internet in addressing many bad cases of governance around the world. Uh, and I guess as a human race, we've shown this is really an issue. If you have too much power in a certain place, bad governance sure. comes to be a result of it. You also have a company that really makes the lives of billions of people, people better every day and to a certain extent controls the lives of billions of people. 
what type of governance structure should we aim for with a company that is so powerful and that at the moment does so much good? How can we make this so sustainable so that it remains the case in the future? Well, part of the, the answer to that is that the company was founded under a set of values. And one of the sort of rules about corporations is that the values once set don't really change. You know, formed evil, remain evil. Formed great, remain great, or as great as you can be. Uh, and I think the governance structure of Google, and in particular the values of the two founders, are so imbued in the culture today, I can't imagine that it would be easy to change in any future scenario. So I think for the rest of our lives, I, I suspect you're going to see Google in a sort of a roughly similar position. Um, the, a variant of your question is the regulation question. And information is regulated pretty thoroughly by, by countries already. And when I think about it, I don't think of it in a European context, because Europe, Europe is a pretty well-run place. I mean, we can debate that. But the fact of the matter is it's a rule of law. The people are honest. There's relatively little corruption. I think a lot about what happens in countries where there isn't rule of law and where the governments are busy trying to game the system to their own advantage. You all spend most of your time complaining about your political system. I can assure you that in the United States, we spend most of our time complaining about our political system. Imagine being in Pakistan, Thailand, right, Afghanistan, on and on and on. So uh, thank God we're in Europe. Thank God we're in the US compared to those places. And so what I would say is that Google's mission in those countries is to bring some of the Western values right, to those countries. And we serve as a thorn in their side, which is why they're constantly blocking us. And we'll continue that, by the way, because it's great fun. Let's see some more questions. Let's go ahead. Number six. We have a new number six. And I'm not a number either. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Aidan. I have a question. You mentioned um, the, that many countries that had very limited access to your systems or to Facebook uh, saw the uprise of that and actually went to the Arab Spring. And I think you mentioned the example of Tunisia. Uh, it's fair to say that now in these countries they have access to all your tools. And it's also fair to say that a few years after the revolution, uh, the situation is not glorious, to say the least. So given that now these countries have access to any information, to the internet and everything else, and that the revolution has occurred, where in your view did it go wrong? And what is it that we can do to help further? There's a view that the internet arrives and that once you empower the citizens, democracy flourishes, the system becomes orderly, the rule of law takes over, and it's sort of a kumbaya moment. Uh, this is clearly false. Uh, the road to democracy of any form, or modern modernity, is, is a difficult one. It's a long-term one. And in the book, we talk about this. We interview Henry Kissinger, who talks a lot about this and his own generational context. And what we say, basically, is it's much easier to start a revolution because of the internet, and it's much harder to finish one. So imagine the plight of these poor folks in the Arab Spring. They managed to get rid of these evil dictators who were inhibiting growth, inhibiting civil rights, did not promote rule of law, generally had secret police. I mean, these are really bad architectures for human organization. And they're replaced by what, right? Now, it takes decades to develop the leadership skills to organize a society, to become a great leader. Uh, again, you, I mentioned Mandela before. He's an example. There are many in history. Um, these sort of great leaders develop their skills, their human skills. They know how to get people organized. They have a unique ability that most of us do not. In a society which has had an internet revolution, such people aren't around, except perhaps the religious leaders, which is what's happened. So now you have a religious, you have the religious leaders taking over the country for whatever reason, and you have everyone now connected, and so expectations are beginning to rise very fast. So I argue that these are danger points where the country could slide back or forward. I'll give you an example of in Myanmar, Burma. So 18 months ago, the generals, for whatever reason, we can debate the reason, decide to open up. They release the lady in the lake, um, and they finally allow freedom of expression after 50 years of absolute dictatorial control, police state control over the country. Sanctions, the whole bit, are lifted. It's a wonderful country. You should definitely visit. Um, what happens? Well, the moment you lift that, all of the sectarian and religious violence becomes worse. Because one of the things that the government had been doing was clamping down on that, along with clamping down everybody else. So now, on what happens on the internet, 
there, there's violence in the town that we were in. There was a, there was a big fight, which is horrendous, above us. Um, and on the internet, the rumors are much worse. So the government sits there and says, this internet thing is bad, right? Because not only do we have people really being killed, which is bad, obviously bad, but we've also got people using the internet to incite further violence. They then pass a law, or sorry, in the process of passing a law, which will return Myanmar to the level of uh, media control, et cetera, that you find in the Soviet Union and China. A step backward, something we should fight. So that's what I worry about. I worry that these countries go through the, the optimism that we all saw, and we all are, because we're naturally optimists, we all think that's gonna happen. They get to this danger point, and then there's this huge retrenchment because they've never had this empowerment, and with empowerment, empowerment of evil people comes along with good people. Let's see more. This lady up here, number four. You are number four. Oh, number four, what does that mean? Um, first of all, thank you so much for an inspiring and interesting talk. Um, right. My question is partly for everyone else in this room. Um, t leaving aside the astonishing capacity and possibilities for development in the sorts of countries that you've been mentioning, Burma, Kenya, and the like. I'm just wondering if anyone else in this room is slightly terrified by the picture that you painted when, for example, the first person you wake, after you wake up in the morning, the first thing, person that you talk to is your super intelligent digital personal assistant, regardless of who might be lying beside you, for example, and that in some fundamental way, it might be that all of this technology is actually corrosive to our human relationships, despite the fact that, as you say, this is about opening up the world in terms of the friendships that we might make. And that part of what it is to be human, if we're thinking about what search is, an essential quality of search is discovery. And if our super intelligent assistant has basically seen ahead to the rest of our day, and it knows what's gonna happen, it knows where we should go, and it's gonna guide us along that way, that we miss those serendipitous moments that Mr. Timmerman was talking about earlier, that we miss what might be unknown along the path, and that in some way as a human being might not be right. the greatest thing for spiritual development. We, we of course have a technical solution to your spiritual question. Of course you do. <laughs> So I, I omitted your, your uh, shall we say, apartment partner out of modesty. Um, but presumably you would talk to him or her uh, as appropriate. Uh, the, the, would you though, because how many of us, when we uh, wake up in the morning already, the first thing we do is check our phones. We probably don't even say hello to our partner. Well, uh, or is that just me? <laughs> Please tell me that. Uh, I'm not even gonna answer that question. I think that uh, the, the simplest answer is that these devices have off buttons. And it's very important to know, yes they do, there is an off button. If you give me your phone, I'll show it to you where it is. <laughs> and, and it's very important. I try very, very hard to turn my devices off during dinner, which it gets shorter and shorter because I can only have it off for so period. But I think it's important to respect both the power and the limitations of the digital world. Um, and, and sort of the, uh, at Google, for example, for a long time, and Nikesh will, will remember this very well, I enforced the 60-minute rule, which is that one, once a week for 60 minutes, we had to turn off all of our devices and actually have a meeting where we had to actually talk to each other. Right? You had to look at each other. So Nikesh and others would sit there with their Blackberries before, before Android underneath the table. We would catch them and there was a fine. Am I right? Yes. You remember. We eventually gave up because we were unable to, to turn off our devices while working for 60 minutes once a week. That's how powerful this technology is. So, so my answer is a couple fold. The serious answer is that serendipity is something that we can generate and that in fact we can select and, and, and have interesting surprises for you with respect to people. Think of the etymology of serendipity. Uh, I understand. Think I about understand. what you just said. I, serendipity I do, I, is something that we can generate. I do. It's called random number generation. And what happens with, ser with serendipity is, if you think about newspapers, right, there's some curated uh, site that you went to. We can do things which are very similar, and we could probably do them with greater breadth than a human can. That's literally how good it is. So you ask two different questions. The first is human interaction. I would argue human inter interaction becomes more, not less, because you meet more people, you have more opportunities to find the right people to work, play, and enjoy. Uh, and the second thing is that computers, computers can help you get rid of the other um, inefficient aspects of your life so you can spend more time playing and interacting. I really do believe that. More questions? Uh, yeah. Over here. Oh, I'm sorry, and then this lady over here. 
Hi. Yeah, give it. You go ahead oh. first. Yes, sir. Yes. I am Eduard from Prague, and I am very sorry, but I can't agree with your enthusiastic optimistic, optimism about the influence of internet on the, on the human rights or any other. Uh, it is everything similar to the knife, fire, atomic energy, nuclear energy. It can be used and abused. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, important for the mankind and the improvement of the mankind is the history. And all the totalist uh, governments try to change history on demand. You can, you can read about it in 1948 or in 451 Fahrenheit. Both these uh, books describe how the government tried to change history or to remove the history of the, uh, of the man, of the world, totally as to remove the books at all. Now everything is moving to cloud. Now, the books are not as much read. Maybe in the US they are paying two bucks per reading e-books, not paper books. And nobody, maybe somebody remembered that Amazon was the very first company who abused internet and electronic distribution of the books. And what is the interesting point that they have no rights for the book 1984, and they should remove it from all Kindles three years ago. But it is the similar as the destroying of the, of the data on computer with the virus or other malware, but much more strange or even, even horrible will is if somebody change data slowly. And it is the way how the internet and the history of the man can be abused. So be careful. And finally, <laughs> you can imagine, or everybody should imagine, that Google, as a king of the internet, can abuse its own forces. Be careful. It is too, for our, our, all of us, not just for Google. OK, thank you. I, uh, I, disagree with, I disagree with some of your points, and so let me give you an example. Um, we, in fact, have the inverse problem with respect to data. In our book, we talk about how the fact that there is no delete button and that information once distributed is very hard to get off the Internet. So I disagree with you about the Fahrenheit 451 and other scenarios. I think it's very, very unlikely that any information can be, at some basic level, removed. And the more important the information, the harder it is to delete because there's always multiple servers. And the way the internet is organized, the replication capability is fundamental to its architecture. It's what bedevils copyright and governments and those sorts of things. So I think that's one comment. I think the second is that in many of the examples that you used, 1984, for example, there's systematic evil. It's very, very difficult to implement systematic evil now in an internet age. And I'll give you an example. We were in Rwanda, in Rwanda in 1994, had this terrible, um, essentially genocide, 750,000 people were killed over a four month period by machetes, which is a horrific, horrific way to do this. It required planning, people had to write it down. What I think about is in 1994, if everyone had a smartphone, it would have been impossible to do that. That people would have actually noticed this was going on, the plans would have been leaked, somebody would have figured out and somebody would have reacted to prevent this terrible carnage. Some more questions over here, yes. Way in the back, number five. We'll come over here. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good morning, and thank you so much for this very interesting um, speech. My name is Bianca Jagger, and I have a foundation called the Bianca Jagger Human Drive Foundation. And I was very interesting, but your objective to make a difference in the world. As you know, um, governments from throughout the world got together to what they call the Millennium Development Goals but they forgot to include ending violence against women and ending discrimination against women or, or gender discrimination. And I know how useful is Google Earth, for example, for indigenous people with who I work, with my foundation, to be able to know when they're gonna be to have their land invaded by 
gold diggers by, or by uh, loggers, etc. Is there any way you think that you could perhaps achieve by 2015 what governments have failed to do and perhaps join forces with all the organizations that are working throughout the world to end violence against women and end discrimination against women as well and help all those girls that uh, I'm glad you have seen in places like Afghanistan, but which is not only happening in countries like Afghanistan or Iran or Saudi Arabia, but it's happening right here. It's happening all over the world. Violence against women, it is something that is happening and we need to worry. And I will be speaking this afternoon about that. But what I want to know is, could you put all your tools, all your power behind to achieve this? Thank you. Um, thank you. And we obviously agree with your both premise and opportunity. I would argue that the internet is the single best empowerment tool for women worldwide. Again, in studying the plight of women in, the, in this extra next five billion, lack of access to uh, critical resources, the violence that occurs every day against women by men, the lack of empowerment and the lack of education, educate a woman, educate a village, I think everyone's familiar with those ideas. The internet is the primary and fastest way for you to scale all of that. So Google spent a lot of time with that, and we're, we would certainly be sympathetic to your proposal about putting even more resources behind it. That's how powerful the idea is. Let's see, this lady had a question. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Bidia. I'm from Jordan, and my question is in two parts. First is a question, second is a request. Sure. The first is about regulation of the internet. Right. As we all know that, and thank you, Google, for all the good you do all over the world, but you can learn about, you know, how to build a bomb on the internet. Children sure. can watch hardcore pornography. Uh, many young Muslims in this country are radicalized by the, the distorted preachings they have access to on the internet. So what would you say about you know, regulation of the internet and responsible regulation? The second is a request, and forgive me if I misunderstood you, but earlier on in your presentation, you spoke about Western values and bringing Western values to the rest of the world. And I don't want to come across as the chippy foreigner, but please can you move beyond that language and recognize that they're not exclusively Western values. You know, respecting human, human life and the rule of law, these are also Muslim values. These are, these are values that go across the world. And as an international cooperation with such a global reach, I would really appreciate it if you would lead the way by Good. moving beyond I'll that have, terminology. I agree with Thank that. You. I agree with that. I'll, 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 change, I'll change my rhetoric as appropriate. I think that's very good. Uh, so your first question was about, go ahead. Remind me your first question, regulation. the regulation question. Um, the, the problem with internet regulation is who would do it and how would it work? And from our perspective, you're better off taking a position that additional regulation is net negative. And in fact, in the book, we spend a lot of time talking about um, the danger of countries which find information th so threatening that they will filter the internet. Classic example being China. Human society seems to operate pretty well when it doesn't know what it's missing. It's a bizarre property. But if you look at China, the Chinese are generally happy even though they don't have a certain amount of dissent because they are not aware of the dissent. So we as a company have tried very hard to make people aware of the political speech that's being censored in China with all sorts of bad outcomes you know, for us and others. But governments don't, there's a whole bunch of governments which don't fundamentally want free, freedom of speech, freedom of political com conversation and so forth, which we're very committed to. So I worry that in a regulation path, the first thing that goes, um, the, the classic example, um, and again, I'm sorry to use an Arab world example, but in most of the Arab states, pornography is illegal, perfectly reasonable from a cultural perspective. Their definition of pornography includes an awful lot of what we would think of as political speech. Right? So that's an example of this problem. So in general, I think you're better off taking a position of no regulation of the internet on a content basis and rather regulate the behavior. I would also disagree with you that the internet is being used to radicalize. The evidence is that people are being radicalized without the internet the internet perhaps enables some of the messaging, but the radicalization is not occurring because of the internet. It's, it's occurring because of evil people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all inf not all information. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't organize the world of only information that I like. 
So you're better off, in my view, having other human systems that address that. I would furthermore say it is absolutely true that there is bad information on the internet and stuff which can be, if you're evil, you can go get it and so forth. But the evidence, and we present this in the book, is that it's also much easier to detect this stuff before really something bad happens. So the internet seems to be a net aid for the police who are investigating terrorist cells and things like that. So on balance, it looks to me like the openness of the internet remains a net positive for safety, security, and uh, defeating radicalization and narrow thinking. My core argument about t sort of teenage, teenage boys, which is typically the source of the problem here, is give them some choices, give them some information, allow their natural human curiosity to defeat the person who's pounding them and pounding them and pounding them about information. And I think that's a principle that applies globally and in all religions and, and cultures. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, let's see, number four, and then we'll be done. Uh, I'm Sodi Kapoor. I run the international think tank Redefine. Uh, now, you said something really interesting now, which is it's amazing how much human beings can stand when they don't know what they're missing. Yeah. And that's a very, very crucial point. And of course, one of the biggest things the internet technology has done is exactly made people aware of exactly what they're missing. So on the one hand, you have the poorest people in the world now being able to see exactly how the, let's say, top 1% lives, and often cheek by jowl within their country. And on the other side, technology has actually allowed for scalability to happen, which means that the uh, billionaire in India probably has access to the same sort of markets that the billionaire in the United States does. So never before in history have such a situation existed where those, let's call them plutocrats to generate some controversy, uh, those plutocrats who have essentially benefited from having access to global markets have got as little to do with the people that they originate from. And there's very little of, you know, historically for uh, several reasons, the robber barons generated uh, charitable foundations. They didn't want to get mobbed, or they had a feeling of uh, you know, being a kindred spirit within society. So on the one hand, technology is actually making people aware of exactly what they're missing. And on the other hand, it is actually enabling people to live completely separate lives within countries. And the kind of challenges that many of the poorest countries are now facing, where you have record levels of wealth and record levels of poverty living cheek by jowl has never existed before. So there is a great potential of conflict. And what, if anything, can technology do to kind of smooth the path? Um, you're asking a political question and an economic question. I think the technology roughly enables everybody, and it enables people at scale to also become more powerful, greater reach. I disagree with you that as a result, people will become less involved with their local <laughs> communities. And I would argue that, that, that over the next 20 or 30 years, we will see enormously large philanthropic efforts from these new plutocrats, as you describe them, uh, who, who have found themselves possessed with this enormous wealth and reach. That is my own opinion. Um, I, I would roughly argue that, that the world is becoming more similar rather than more different because of this global elite and that you have people who have now a stake in multiple countries, you have enormous transborder flows. It's much harder to imagine true conflict, true war, and so forth with so many powerful people who have economic interests in avoiding it. So that's sort of statement number one. I think statement number two is that the, um, the sum of the, the sort of visibility that the internet and others provide serves in a check and balance against the plutocrats. Um, there are many, many examples of countries where once Google Maps came out, people discovered that the ruler owned all of this land that nobody knew. And in fact, you can crowdsource for corruption by saying, let's crowdsource and build a map of the country where you tell us who owns what plots of land. Most countries don't actually have proper land records. And so it turns out that the ruling party, the king or what have you, owns you know, a quarter or whatever it is of the country and all illegally and they stole it and so forth and so on. What happens after that is a matter of conjecture, right? You've got a powerful leader, you've got empowered citizens, right? Well, we all want a peaceful transition to a more democratic basis. I would tell you that in my view, because of the internet, societies will ultimately organize themselves around the interests of the middle class of the societies. That it will not be possible for the plutocrats or the very poor to take over the country. 
but that the middle class and whatever their values are can probably drive the outcome to their satisfaction. There's too many of them, they're too important to the country, and they're too empowered. I think with that, I've run over, and I'm told I have to get finished. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all coming, and I'll see you soon.